All right, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. And welcome to the 25th, 2015 Governor's Prayer Breakfast. I'm Major Mike Roberts from the Missouri National Guard. And what I've noticed through the years of uh, emceeing this fine event at the start of the legislative session is I'm apparently not speaking to you in the proper language. The call for seating doesn't work, so I'll bring a gavel next time or recommend to the, to the next guy. So we'll, we'll bring it to you in your language. At this time, I'd like to introduce those seated on the platform. Beginning from my right, Representative Gail McCann Beatty of Kansas City. <laughs> Senator-elect Jill Shoup of Creve Corps. <laughs> Speaker of the House, John Deal of Town and Country. Timing is everything, right? <laughs> Senate President Pro Tem Tom Dempsey of St. Charles. <laughs> Our host today, Missouri's 55th Governor, Jay Nixon. <laughs> Missouri's First Lady, George Ann Nixon. <laughs> Our guest speaker and his wife, Les Steckel on the end, and his wife, Chris, next to the <laughs> First Lady. We'd also like to recognize the following groups and individuals and ask them to stand. The Governor's Student Leadership Forum on Faith and Values. Back in the corner. Our statewide elected officials who are here this morning, Lieutenant Governor Peter Kinder, State Treasurer Clint Zweifel, State Auditor Thomas Schweik, Attorney General Chris Coster, Secretary of State Jason Kander. The Justices from the Missouri Supreme Court. The Adjutant General of the Missouri National Guard, Steve Danner. And finally, if all other elected officials could stand to be recognized. Thank you all for being here. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please rise for the presentation of the colors by the Central Region Color Guard of the Missouri Department of Corrections. In preparation for the Pledge of Allegiance, please, uh, civilian members, place your hand over your heart. Military uniformed members uh, remain standing at the position of attention. Please join Major General Danner in the Pledge of Allegiance.
To perform our national anthem this morning, we are pleased to have the Boonville Chamber Choir from Boonville High School under the direction of Mr. Warner Bailey. And thank you and well done to the Boonville Chamber Choir for that rendition of the National Anthem. Please remain standing for the invocation by Dr. Doyle Sager, Senior Pastor of the First Baptist Church in Jefferson City. Let's pray together. Gracious and loving God, thank you for this new day, for this new year, and for this new legislative session. We thank you for the food that is set before us, for its bounty and nourishment, for the farmers who grew it, and for all who are serving us today. But Lord, just as we enjoy food for our stomachs, we also hunger this morning for justice. We long for a wholeness and a healing to come to your world and to this part of your world called Missouri. So give us the courage, all of us the courage, during the coming session to make moral choices which will nourish all of our citizens in body, mind, and spirit. As we share this meal, teach us how to mimic you in generosity, justice, and love. In your holy name we pray, amen. All right, ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Enjoy your meal. Our program will begin at 8 o'clock.
got to give this. You and Roberts got to give this. He'll be fine. He'll be fine. Steckle's a good guy. Yeah. He's still. I think he's supposed to have one of the other professional type of people. He gives. He lets people do anything. You know what I mean? That's the kind of NBA. That's what he does. Yeah. It's. I'll let you keep us on schedule. As you finish your meal, we invite you to enjoy the musical selections performed by the Boonville Chamber Choir.
Well done. Thank you, Director Bailey and the Boonville Chamber Choir. Story with that is, is apparently at Boonville High School today, they've got a late start. So all the other students go in later this morning and they had to get up extra early this morning to come here. So it's the price they have to pay for. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we'll continue on with the uh, prayer breakfast and we ask you to take your seats, please. Our first reading this morning will be given by Senator-elect Jill Shoup. Thank you, Major Roberts. Our first reading is from the book of Psalms, chapter 100. Shout for joy to the, to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before the Lord with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is the Lord who made us, and we are the Lord's. We are God's people, the sheep of God's pasture. Enter God's gates with thanksgiving and God's courts with praise. Give thanks to the Lord and praise God's name. For the Lord is good and God's love endures forever. God's faithfulness continues throughout all generations. At this time, Senate President Pro Tem Dempsey, Speaker Deal, Representative McCann Beatty, and Representative-Elect Joe Adams of University City will lead us in prayer. They will end their petition or each petition with, Lord, in your mercy, your response is, hear our prayer. Thank you. Lord, we ask your blessings upon our state and nation. Enable us to make wise use of the abundance you have bestowed upon your people. Lord, in your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, give guidance to the elected officials, judges, and all public servants of our communities, state, and country to discern and do your will that we might best serve you and our citizens. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we ask you protect those who have put themselves in harm's way on our behalf. The men and women of our armed forces, our law enforcement officers, and our firefighters. Give them the strength and courage to do their work. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, bless the efforts of those in our state who provide gainful employment for our citizens, those who endeavor to provide for their families, those who educate our children, and those who care for the sick, the infirm, and the elderly. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we ask that you give comfort to those who mourn the loss of a loved one, healing to those suffer from illness and disease and hope to those who despair from loneliness or the loss of job. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray that we are strengthened and directed to be instruments of your will, so that in the words of your prophet Amos, justice rolls down like waters, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we ask you grant wisdom and a noble sense of purpose to those who have chosen a life of public service. Bless and direct their work so that it gives lasting benefit to our citizens. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, help us remember always how richly you have blessed us. 
and that you transform our gratitude for your blessings into actions to help our neighbor. We bring these prayers to you with praise and thanks, and we do all this for your glory. Amen. Our second reading will be given by Representative Scott Fitzpatrick of Shell Knob. Our second reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, 22nd chapter. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Thank you. It is now my honor to introduce the host of this year's prayer breakfast, Missouri Governor Jay Nixon. Jay Nixon is, the sec is in his second term as Missouri's 55th governor. He was first elected governor in November 2008 and re-elected in November 2012. A native of DeSoto, Missouri, he was raised in a family of public servants. His mother, the late Betty Nixon, was a teacher and served as president of the local school board. His father, Jerry Nixon, was elected mayor of DeSoto and was a judge for the community. Growing up in a home of these strong examples, Governor Nixon learned at a young age that faith and family come first, and giving back to the community comes next. It is a philosophy that has guided him throughout his career in public service. As governor, he has put forward an agenda to make government more efficient, effective, and responsive to the needs of Missouri families. He is committed to continuing his work with the leaders of both parties to attract the jobs of the future to Missouri, make health care more affordable, and place education and place a college education within reach of middle class students. Governor Nixon and his wife, George Ann, have two sons, Jeremiah and Wilson. They belong to the First United Methodist Church of Jefferson City. Ladies and gentlemen, Missouri Governor Jay Nixon. Thank you. Good, good morning. Thank you and good morning. Uh, two quick notes, and I'll get to my very short uh, comments here, and then we'll turn it over to uh, uh, the leader of Fellowship Christian Athletes, Coach Steckel, to move us this morning. Uh, the first of those is that uh, we got like an extra football coach with us, the Missouri State University Bears football coach, Dave Steckel, is with us today. <laughs> uh, uh, he's, uh, he's fast at work at, uh, at Missouri State. We're very proud that he's uh, moved from one of our great programs to another in our state, and we're honored to have you with us this morning, uh, Coach. Uh, the other thing I had a chance to do this morning um, was uh, – play a little game with uh, this Coach Steckel. Um, those of you that have done a little research or look at his bio there, his book, one of his books, but his most important book that launched him from the NFL to Fellowship of Christian Athletes um, is called One Yard Short. Uh, he had the, the very bad uh, career move to be coaching at the Tennessee Titans during the Super Bowl with the Rams at one point. And uh, most of you will remember that final play um, in which uh, Mike Jones made a tackle and we got a trophy and I think it was better on our side of the field than it was theirs, but he was, that's a play that he called. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this morning for the first time, I, I invited up to have a short meeting with, with Coach Steckel for the first time meeting in his life, he met the Lincoln University football coach, Mike Jones. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and... Uh, um, Jones tackled him, and, <laughs> and then they had a good discussion. Um, 
But we thank uh, Coach Jones for being here today. He's, he's got some student athletes with him. We thank him for his uh, personal involvement in Fellowship of Christian Athletes, uh, like many coaches around uh, uh, the region, around the state at all levels. Uh, that kind of leadership makes a, a real difference in those young folks' lives, and it's a, it's a great mission. So I, uh, uh, it was a unique opportunity, and we, we didn't want to pass it by. I think uh, he gets the microphone after me, so he can say whatever he wants. Uh, George and I want to welcome everybody here today. Um, it's a new year, new legislative session. I want to tell you, uh, not very many states do this, and we do it well, and it means a lot. Uh, to join in prayer, to join in peace as we start uh, this time of the year is so, so important for all of us as we try to continue to remember who we, who we serve and the order in which we serve them. I especially want to welcome those who are entering, entering the General Assembly for their first terms and who will be sworn in later today. Um, so I can, you're not a rep or a senator till about noon, so um, enjoy the last few hours of uh, <laughs> normalcy. Then I've got a couple of constituent questions for you. Uh, but there's a great responsibility that comes with being elected to serve the people of Missouri. Uh, but there's also a sense of comfort in knowing that Missourians are praying for you as well. One of the great parts of the job I have is how many times when you travel the state, after you shake someone's hand, they'll pull you just a little bit closer and say, I'm praying for you every day. And I just want to tell you that it, it for you all, will feel that same from your constituents. It really makes a difference. Uh, it allows us, I think, to, to keep clear our priorities, uh, respect, and work together. Now, if you haven't been to the governor's prayer breakfast before, you're now joined a tradition that goes back more than 50 years and at least 10 governors. For one morning, there are no differences. We stand united in asking for guidance from God to direct the course of our state and to do so in such a way that benefits six million men, women, and children who live in our great show me state. Because those six million Missourians are certainly among the neighbors that Jesus is talking about in the verses from Matthew that is the theme for our prayer breakfast that Representative Fitzpatrick just read. Jesus distilled all the commandments into the two that he said were the first and second greatest commandments. First, love God with every fiber of your being. And second, Love your neighbor as yourself. Everything else hangs on those two commandments, he said. These are clear and direct words that, unfortunately, we often have trouble putting into practice. Now, when anyone who tells you that the Bible doesn't contain humor hasn't really read it very closely. <laughs> because the question that sets up the answer from Jesus is posed by someone who wants to trip him up with the answer. Go back and read that section a question posed by an expert in the law, or as he might be better identified, a lawyer. <laughs> it's not the only time in the New Testament where a lawyer gets an answer that's unexpected. In fact, the Bible may be considered one of the earliest resources of lawyer jokes. <laughs> now, there are a lot of ways that each of us can love our neighbors as ourselves, and many great examples we can follow. One of those is here in Jefferson City, the Samaritan Center an agency right here in the capital city that has been providing assistance to those in need for almost 30 years. On a day when the temperature outside isn't expected to rise above the single digits, it's not difficult to imagine the plight of some of those individuals and families where the household income can't be stretched far enough and tough choices that have to be made about food and warm clothes, heating, and health care. The Samaritan Center helps thousands of mid-Missourians with those needs every year and depends on the generosity and love of neighbors like you and me. When Major Roberts did the introductions earlier, he asked those attending the gov here that are part of the Governor Student Leadership Forum to stand and be recognized. At the end of our program today, many of those students will be at the doors collecting a free will offering for the Samaritan Center, and I thank you in advance for whatever you can give today for this great organization. As I said before, it's just when, you, when you're as cold as you are, when we're as well-dressed and well taken care of as we are, uh, you can only man the demands of the Samaritan Center. Please, if you could be generous in that free will offering. And if you have a chance to say, have a chance, please say thanks to those students for giving up time from their semester breaks to be here in Jeff City. Many of you may not be familiar with the Student Leadership Forum that for 28 years has benefited from this breakfast. I had the opportunity to meet with them last night and take some of their questions, many of which were incredibly insightful, some stunningly difficult. These are some of the 70 students from several of Missouri's colleges, both public and private, who have been selected by their university presidents to hear about great examples of leading by serving. 
It's a tremendous program that is helping to foster the next generation of leaders in our state. So, as the 2015 General Assembly moves forward, there will be no doubt areas of disagreement. That is the nature of the system of government we have. Quite frankly, it's designed that way. People have different districts, different areas, different beliefs, different values. It is designed to clash together differing ideas. But even during those times of disagreement, it is vital that we act in a spirit of fellowship that's not question each other's sincerity in wanting to do what they sincerely believe is right. Our prayers can help give us the understanding to navigate through the times ahead, especially when they are uncertain. So I thank each of you and the thousands of folks that each person here represents for your continued prayers as we work together to move our great state forward. May God continue to bless our state and its people. Thank you and God bless. Thank you, Governor. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for today's Governor's Prayer Breakfast. In 2005, Les Steckel became the seventh president and CEO of the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. This followed a football coaching career over more than three decades at the high school, college, and professional level. Some of his coaching highlights include serving as head coach of the Minnesota Vikings, being a coach on two Super Bowl teams, the Patriots and the Titans, and coaching Brentwood High School to the Tennessee 5A State Championship. Coach Steckel also served our country for 30 years in the Marine Corps and the Marine Corps Reserve, retiring at the, of the rank of Colonel. Les and Chris Steckel have three children and three grandchildren, and we, have, and we are pleased to have him as our speaker this morning. Will you please join me in welcoming Coach Les Steckel. Please, please stay seated. <laughs> please stay seated. You know, they gave me uh, 40 seconds between plays in the National Football League to call offensive plays that, as you just heard from the governor, <clears throat> came up one yard short at one moment. But I'm going to ask everyone here to stand, no timeouts, no delay of games, and move, and ch move your chairs in a comfortable position because some of you will be at a chiropractor tomorrow the way you're sitting. So let's all stand. <laughs> Get your chairs nice and comfortable, and we can go forward. I appreciate that introduction. It was exciting to see the color guard, to see uniforms in the audience. And uh, being a Marine, and my younger brother, Dave, being the Marine, uh, we take great, shall we say, pride in serving our country. So I'm going to ask, are there any jarheads in the audience? Any jarheads at all? If so, please stand up. Hoorah. <laughs> Two men and one woman. That commercial keeps going. We're just looking for a few. <laughs> you know, as mentioned also, I was uh, the head coach of the Minnesota Vikings. And I'm sure, you know, on December 7th, we all think about Pearl Harbor. And that event happened just one time. As head coach of the Vikings, uh, the Minnesota Vikings, under my leadership, got bombed 13 times. <laughs> Matter of fact, they started a survey in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and they wanted to change the name Vikings to Possums. And I got a little upset during preseason in the early part of the season. And sure enough, I started thinking, you know, it's true. When we play at home, we play dead. And when we go on the road, we get killed. <laughs> I thought that'd be a pretty good name. <laughs> Unbelievable. The Fellowship of Christian Athletes has been around for 60 years. On October 10th, we celebrated the 60th year of this great ministry. And on October 10th, or I should say November 10th, excuse me, we celebrated FCA's 60th year, and also we celebrated the 239th anniversary of the Marine Corps. Special days in my heart. I have to tell you, the theme of FCA for years has been 
influence. And influence is something that I think is powerful when you have the right model. And in the Marine Corps, I learned about physical fitness, and I've always wanted to influence many people on the importance of physical fitness. And I have failed miserably. But one person, my grandmother, who lived in Cementon, Pennsylvania, wonderful lady, I went to see her when she was 65 years old on her birthday. And I said, Grammy, I've never been around anyone with such great spirit as you. And I love your attitude. But I said, Grammy, we want you to be around forever, and I'm hoping to encourage you and influence you. Just walk three to five miles every day, every day, starting today on your birthday. And I can hear her with her Pennsylvania accent say, Les, I'm going to do it. And she walked that day, and she walked the next day, and she's been walking for years. Matter of fact, last week she turned 99, and we have no idea where she's at. <laughs> Governor Nixon, First Lady, Mrs. Nixon, distinguished guests, members of this great state of Missouri, I want to tell you I'm humbled and honored to be asked to speak at this special event. And I hope in the next few minutes that as a coach in a locker room before the game, we can get your attention. You know, speaking of locker rooms, that question's coming up. Who's number one? Is it going to be Oregon or Ohio State? Who's going to be the world champions in the NFL? Will it be the Patriots? Will it be the Seahawks? I want to ask you this question. Who's number one in your life? Is it your job? Is it your career? Is it your position? Is it the prestige that comes with a powerful position? Oh, I'm sure you may say family. Success, the question is really, deep in your heart, who is number one? Well, I have a story I'd like to share, and we all have a story. As a football coach, I've been blessed for 40 years to be married to my wife, Chris. And I can tell you that it's been a journey. We've lived in 11 states, made 12 moves. We were actually with 13 teams. And I can tell you this, we have a story we want to share, and I know all of us have a story. So allow me to briefly share with you my personal testimony, are you listening, of a driven man. I grew up in Pennsylvania, in eastern PA, and as Steck, my brother, can tell you, all the dads worked at Bethlehem Steel, cement mills, college was out of the question. But we had parents that truly made sure education was important in our lives. And we saw what was taking place. If I told you about my background as a young man growing up, you wouldn't believe you'd ask me to stand up here and talk. The next thing you know, I failed the physical to go to the United States Naval Academy, which was my dream. Oh, I was president of the class, president of the student body, captain of the teams of the three sports that I played, not captain of all three. And went out to, scared to death to tell you this, Kansas University. <laughs> I was this hot shot running back out of Pennsylvania. And I know some of you have asked me what position I played, and so I always ask a question when I'm asked a difficult question. Have you ever heard of Gail Sayers? Have you ever heard of Hall of Fame running back John Riggins? That's why you never heard of me. Well, one evening, one of my teammates asked me to come to an event where I would hear someone speak with a ministry called Campus Crusade, and I told him I didn't need any of that religious jazz. And sure enough, his 6'6", 275-pound frame had me there. And I had just won a Golden Gloves boxing title as a light heavyweight champion. I grew up as an angry kid. I fought a lot, and now I had an opportunity to displace that. And I was sitting there one night, and this is what I heard. This gentleman said, over here on this side, and he made a fist, 
He said, you're born. You have no control of that. And over here on this side, you're going to die. And you have no control of that. Oh, you want to take a gun, stick it in your mouth, and pull the trigger? You call that control? But he said, I'm wondering how many people tonight are willing to understand that you had no control of your birth, and you will have no control of your death, and are you tough enough, is what he said, to relinquish that timeline to Jesus Christ? Well, when he said tough enough, I was listening. I didn't make some sudden change. I thought about it and contemplated, spoke to a handful of people, and at age 19, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior, but not my Lord. People oftentimes put that in the same sentence. See, I was like Aaron Rodgers on that insurance commercial, discount double check. I bought the fire insurance, but that was about it. But what he said that night was, if you accept Christ as your personal Savior, you will receive not only peace in your life, but purpose and power and pardon. I didn't understand pardon. I couldn't even begin to understand what peace was in my life. Power, I had no interest in that. But purpose, I wanted to know why I was put on planet Earth. I've been after that question for years as a young boy and then through college. But at age 19, it made sense. I can remember thinking about what I had done that night. Committed? No. I didn't get it. I really didn't get it. But I wanted to know meaning and purpose in life. Well, fast forward to the day I graduated from college. Yes, in 1968. The next day I joined the Marine Corps. Suddenly I was at Officer's Candidate School, 26 weeks of infantry school, 33 days in a kick, as we said, and off to Vietnam I went. As an infantry officer in charge of 250 Marines and 80 Vietnamese soldiers, and I was 23 years old. It was a war that when we came home, we were told never to wear our uniforms. Some of you may remember that, but I can tell you this. There were a lot of frightening moments, but in February 15th, 1972, when I was honorably discharged from the Marine Corps in active duty, I got on my knees in my apartment and I said to the Lord, I have never been more frightened in my entire life. Oh yeah, I'm familiar with ambush sites. I'm familiar with firefights. Lord, I'm scared to death. What is it you want me to do? Have you asked him that question? Well, I kept turning every way where I was playing on a national football team in Quantico, Virginia, and my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, and many of my Marine friends who still are, said, you ought to be a football coach. You love football. And I said, that's the last thing I'll ever do. And let me tell you why. Because in the 50s and 60s and 70s, you were abused you were berated, you were belittled, you were cursed. It was something I wanted no part of and never to do that to anyone. But I can see why the Lord led me to that. Well, six weeks later, I was at the University of Colorado as a graduate assistant, making $150 a month, sleeping on a cot in a garage with no heat. And all of a sudden, this driven man went from there to the United States Naval Academy, to the San Francisco 49ers, to the Minnesota Vikings in 22 months. You see, some of you have heard about type A personalities. I was a triple A type personality. I was in the far left lane going 110 miles an hour. And you want to know why? Are you listening? Because I didn't know at the time that your earthly father, if you know him or not, if he was deceased shortly after you were born or you've never met him, has a mighty impact on your life. And the father factor was affecting my life like I never knew before. You see, I found out early that I was a tired, lonely, angry man because I never was crit critiqued 
in a positive way, I was always told, you can't do this, you can't do that, you'll never amount to anything, and cetera, and cetera. And I was driven in the opposite direction. Yeah, I was on a fast track. Matter of fact, I was the second youngest head coach in the history of the NFL and suddenly fired. And a lady came up to me one day when I spoke at a church and she said, you know, God's broken you. And I remember her walking away from me and saying, what is she talking about? I still didn't get it. Well, after that year of being fired in Minnesota, I quickly went to the New England Patriots, was asked to run the offense, and we went to Super Bowl XX. Talk about a challenge. They still talk about it today, the 1985 Bears. That's who we had to play in Super Bowl XX. I tease people and say I called Pete Rozelle, the commissioner at the time, and asked him if we could have 12 or 13 players to make it a game. <laughs> the greatest defense to ever be known in football. And yes, we went up against them. We lost, but shortly, a day or two afterwards, I was contacted by the Dallas Cowboys to meet with Coach Tom Landry, the legendary coach of the Dallas Cowboys, Hall of Fame coach, and probably the most significant person that represented the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Coach Landry had me in his hotel room in New Orleans, where we privately met where he wanted to, as he had in the past, wanted to hire me, and I wasn't allowed to, but we had a blackboard in his room. Yes, a blackboard with chalk. And for three hours, we ex and owed. And the gentleman that he was, he gets up after three hours. He walks me to his hotel door. He opens the door, and he begins to shake my hand. And he says, Les, you're the most aggressive person I've ever met. As I walked down the hall in that hotel in New Orleans where just recently we played in the Superdome and I saw the Superdome through these glass windows and I thought, I don't think that was a compliment. What's that all about? Well, fast forward to the next season with the Patriots and we're getting ready to play the Denver Broncos in the playoffs and I'm walking to the game plan meeting and I was going to present the game plan to advance this in the playoffs, and Raymond Berry, a Hall of Fame wide receiver for some of you football fans, Johnny Unitas' favorite target. Raymond came up to me as the head coach of the Patriots. He tapped me on the shoulder as I was hurriedly going down the hall, and he said, Les, you're a Christian, right? I, yeah, Raymond, what's that all about? He said, Les, do you have any peace in your life? And I looked at him, and I thought somebody took a marine bayonet, uh, and stuck it right in my heart. Do you have any peace in your life? Hmm. Well, fast forward. He called me into his office. He said, you know, Les, in 1985, the good Lord told me to hire you. And now after this playoff game in 88, for your own good, he's telling me to fire you. Well, I moved away from the New England Patriots and Raymond Berry, who was and still is my spiritual mentor. Fast forward to my brother called me and he said, Les, I know you're looking for a job. He said, uh, Brown University is looking for an offensive coordinator. I said, Brown University, where's that? He said, just down the road in Providence, Rhode Island. So I applied for the job. I was interviewed three times. The head coach, who was a Harvard graduate, met me at a bar in the back, hiding, so that no one would see us. And he said, Les, after three interviews, I must say, I want to offer you the job as offensive coordinator at Brown University. I shook his hand and was excited. And he said, I must tell you something you may not know. We haven't won a game here in three years. And he said, at the end of the year, we're going to get fired. <laughs> and I said to him, that's nothing new to me. <laughs> well, sure enough, we were fired in 1989. And in 1990, folks, I had the 13 greatest, most miserable months of my life. I finally went through that brokenness 
that that lady spoke about six years prior. Brokenness, what is that? What does that look like? See if I can paint you a picture. My wife and I would get up on a Sunday morning. We would take our three children to church. We would come back. As she was preparing the Sunday dinner, I would run out to cut our yard in our home in Foxborough up on a hill where you can stand in our yard and look across and hear the roar of the stadium, feel the electricity, see the press box where I once called plays for a great team for four years. And as I cut that grass, I kept saying to myself, I haven't heard from one person. I haven't gotten one phone call. No one in the business has even written me a note. And I realized I was out there all by myself alone. And I shut that lawnmower off and I ran up this long driveway up the hill and I sprinted through the garage and slammed the door behind me and ran past the brick fireplace that we had and I turned to my right and leaped two and three steps to my bedroom and I jumped in the door, closed it and pushed a little button to lock it and I slid to the side of my bed on my knees and I cried, and I cried, and I cried. That may be a picture of brokenness. How about this? You ever seen a wild stanion up on its hind feet, and it's snorting and kicking dirt and raising its hind legs and running away? And then suddenly, some great individual breaks that horse climbs on that horse, and with just a slight tug of the rein in one direction, that horse follows that direction. That's what brokenness is. Have you been there? You see, I was going down that highway 110 miles an hour, and God slammed on the brakes. I slid to the shoulder of the road, almost going over the cliff, and he told me to look in the rearview mirror and see the history of my life and why I was behaving the way I was. And then he showed me on the side of that car those two blind spot mirrors and to see all the blind spots I had that I never knew about and still have some. Oh, yeah. That's what brokenness is. So in October of 1990, I came to my wonderful wife who loves football, who's been nothing but a great teammate. As mentioned, we spent 27 years in reserves. Can you imagine working 16 hours a day? Yes, seven days a week. Yes, Christmas, Easter, News Day, New Year's Eve day, and then having a six-week vacation, only that time off, and spending it in the Marine Corps. She used to say, where are we going for vacation this year, honey? Camp Pendleton, Quantico, Virginia? 27 years. So I turned to her and I said, you know, Preppy, I call her Preppy, she went to Berkeley. I said, Preppy, what do you think God wants to have us raise our family? She said, why? I said, I don't think I'm ever going to get a job in coaching. No one's ever called me, reached out to me. Where would you like to live? And she said, well, I, I have an idea. I said, why don't you go to Dunkin' Donuts down the road? I'll watch the three kids. And as she tells me, when anybody wants to watch those three kids and I can get away for a minute, I'm off. She comes back and I ask her where she thinks we should move our family and she said, Charlotte, North Carolina. I said, a girl from Southern California wants to live in Charlotte, North Carolina? She said, honey, you've always wanted to be a part of an NFL expansion team. What? I'm, not, I'm never coaching again. Where is it you want to live? So I said, all right, remember the kids on the playground? Here we go. One, two, three, shoot. When I say three, you yell it out. And we went, one, two, three, Boulder, Colorado. Where we first started our coaching career and our marriage together, that's where she wanted to go. I called everyone about insurance, working at bakeries, whatever. I couldn't get a job to save my life. But fast forward to December 24th, 1990, on Christmas Eve, when I was coming down the steps, and I was praying out loud, and I said, Lord, this has been a journey. Tomorrow is the day we celebrate your birth. I want my three children and my wife to look in my eyes and know that I am sold out. I have totally surrendered to your son, Jesus. 
And I want them to see that. But I must confess, I'm the most depressed, down individual you may ever have known. Would you please help me? As I came down those steps and came into the kitchen, I helped my wife with her top coat. You can imagine in Foxborough, Massachusetts, it was cold, and we were headed to Christmas Eve service at our church. I told the three kids to run out to the car and get in. As I was helping my wife with her top coat, the phone rang. I went over to the phone, and I didn't pick it up because I said, I'm an unemployed football coach, and I could get rejected again. And then I realized I hadn't talked to anyone to get rejected. I picked up the phone, and this is what I heard. Are you listening? This is Bill McCartney, head coach at the University of Colorado, founder of Promise Keepers. Les, as you know, we're down here to play Notre Dame for the national championship, and I'm walking to a staff meeting, and out of nowhere, I felt God touch my heart and tell me to call and offer you a job at the University of Colorado in Boulder. He said, we don't have any openings. I don't even know what you're going to coach, much less pay you. But I know one thing, I'm to call and offer you this job. Well, as the kids and I drove to the church, we pulled up into the parking lot and we saw the candlelight service. It was in action. And we told the kids to run in and save us a seat in the pew. And my wife turned to me as I told her the story. And she said this, you know, honey, I think God's telling you to go back to Boulder, back to the University of Colorado, and this time, you listening, do it his way. She's exactly right. At age 44, I finally got it. And I knew one thing. I was, my theme was going to be relationships is the most important thing. And relationships are built by going, first of all, inward, and then upward, and then outward. And I believe once you get inward, as I had to go to the shaft of my bowels and clean out all the yuck to find out why God made me the way he did to do what I can do for him to bring him the glory. Well, we're with the Fellowship of Christian Athletes now. As I said earlier, November 10th, we celebrate our 60th anniversary. And I can still remember at my first camp when I saw an individual by the name of Roger Staubach, Heisman Trophy winner at the U.S. Naval Academy, future Hall of Fame quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys, who I just had lunch with the other day in Dallas, and he's standing at a podium. He was my hero and every young man 700 plus in that audience, standing there sharing his personal intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. Picture that and then push it all over the United States and now all over the world as we're growing. That's what takes place with men and women athletes and coaches making a difference in the young people, in the athletic world today. Christ is being shared nationwide. I want to close by just saying this to you. Dave and I grew up in a pretty rough, tough neighborhood. And uh, as I shared with the Jefferson City high school team yesterday, the most depressing thing I've ever heard, when I was a young kid, these men would take me off the streets and they would take me into a bar and they would sit me down on the stool and they'd be drinking their whiskey and beer and smoking their cigars and they'd be telling me their life stories and I had to sit there and listen as a 12, 13, 14-year-old kid. And the most depressing thing I've ever heard was this. Hey, kid, if I had it to do over again. Hey, kid, if I had it to do over again. See, we all get to one, run one lap around this track. I'm not in the back nine. I don't have four holes to go. I've turned the curve, and I see the tape, and I'm looking forward to sprinting and bursting right through it. I don't know about you. So I leave you with this thought. Take your mind and the eye of your mind and go to New York City on 9-11 with me. You see those planes? You see those burning infernos? 
You see all those people running for their lives from the fire, and then you see scores and hundreds of heroes running to those buildings. Do you see that? This country needs heroes. So I want you to hear this loud and clear if you've heard nothing. If a terrorist can die for a lie, then a Christian should live for the truth. Thank you. Powerful words, Coach. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, our program has almost concluded. Before we finish up today, I'd like to remind you about the free will offering that will be taken at the doors by the students from the Governor's Student Leadership Forum to benefit the mission at the Samaritan Center here in Jefferson City. Our benediction will now be given by Dr. Sager. Please bow with me. Loving God, help us to believe what we sing, help us to live what we pray, and help us to be who you've called us to be. Amen. All right, once again, this has been another great event. Governor, thank you. We appreciate it. Mrs. Steckel, sir, we appreciate you being here. Um, we hope to do it again. Hopefully the weather cooperates a little better next year than it did this year. Of course, it isn't as bad as it has been in years past. So, so with that said, a reminder of the students outside taking that free will offering. Other than that, uh, we wish you the best during the legislative session, and we'll see you next year.